So if you're anything like me, you may find it easy to get distracted in an age of internet sensationalism, short form content, showing that you can just double the size of your turbo, big front mount, crank up the boost, and you're good to go. From where I'm standing, that feels a little bit like gambling and not a calculated performance car. If you feel like it's a gamble to squeeze 500 plus wheel horsepower out of a 1.6 liter engine, this video is gonna show you exactly how that's strategically achieved. This is done through small increments, you know, 5% uh, increase in flow here, maybe 2% cooler temps here, 1% here, 2% there, across the board, rather than just doubling the size of your turbo, tripling the amount of boost in the engine for your TikTok dyno run. That's not what we're here for. Let's go have a chat with Lorenzo. Hello guys, welcome back to my workshop. There will be a lot of valuable information to share. I am operating in a way where I'm a customer of my own product and most of these products exist for my own needs of supporting what I have going through the workshop, what I have for my own cars. So the dedication towards making a truly functional, reliable, efficient product, I give my all 100% and I learn every day, and the more I get to know, the worse it gets. Uh, today we'll be dedicating this specific to the N18 engines, uh, more specific into the 2013 year of production where it has the Bosch high pressure fuel pump. This motor is found in all the latest Cooper S's and JCW with some uh, differences in them. JCW motor has lower compression ratio, Cooper S has higher compression ratio. They are both phenomenal motors. They have uh, a lot of benefits from factory over the N14 engine. They addressed the major PCV issues. This motor, if it's well maintained, it doesn't have so much oil traveling through the crankcase ventilation system. It's a way more balanced. There is uh, rumors uh, where, oh, it's got a better oil pump and stuff like that. No, the oil pump is just as good as the N N14 or vice versa. The only difference is they added a solenoid to calm the oil pressure down when it doesn't need to be, to be high. What I want to highlight about the stock motor, it's a very reliable motor, very robust motor. Majority of like uh, necessary things to create a good reliable build are there from factory. Crank is very strong. It's the same crankshaft that it's in the N14 engine. Uh, I've pushed them to over 400 foot-pounds of torque, never had a crank problem. That eliminates a huge uh, necessity of looking for an aftermarket forged crank because to my personal opinion, the machining quality and the quality control from an OEM manufacturer is way more superior than most uh, aftermarket choices that we have to go with. Uh, bearing choices, factory bearing, uh, very, very, very good quality. I've used them in cars with 500 horsepower. Never had any issues related to oiling, crankshaft, bearings, none of that stuff. The weak link in these motors is the connecting rods and pistons. In between the N14 and N18, the piston has improved in the N18 motor. It has design shape where it's reinforced around the wrist pin both in the Cooper S and in the JCW. JCW has less compression ratio, makes it more friendly for boost. The biggest drawback in the N18 engine is the cylinder head. I have one with me here on the bench to, to highlight a couple things. I will try to give as much information uh, as possible without diving too far technical. So who you're dealing with offering this service to build you a cylinder head or build you an engine, 
to be aware of what things to look for and what things to pay attention to. N18 motor is a very limited motor, how much timing you can get out of it with, with tuning. We use the stock knock control. It is very, very good. It's very fast and uh, it's so much engineer engineering behind a knock control system. If you really don't need to mess with it, don't. Other than that, uh, reinforcing the bottom end is very simple. All you need is a correct uh, compression ratio for the motor. That again is very important and that's uh, one of the things that do improve how much timing you can get by choosing the right compression ratio. Cooper S is 10.5 to 1. JCW it's 10.25 with a thicker head gasket. I've experimented different compression ratios, 9.5, 9.7, 10 to 1, 10.5 to 1, to find what, what works. And to my liking, being able to be a part of the tuning, be a part of building the motor, 10 to 1 seems to be the most everyday, everyday choice. Uh, if you're using 91 or 93 octane fuel with a decent, not too complex engine build, that will probably allow you to operate very efficient. And I'm speaking, having a, a timing friendly engine, not just in the high revs, to have it friendly everywhere. Besides that, the fuel system is very limited in these cars and it's way more limited than the, than the N14. And um, it becomes even more limited when you build a cylinder head that it flows like 30-40% over the, the factory motor. I am not a fan of running methanol. Stock fuel system will give you a good fuel support where it will allow some room for weather temperature changes or like density of the air ch changes. I would say at 260 to 270 wheel horsepower if we translate into, into that. Going back to water methanol, I'm personally not a fan to run it. Yes, it's great. You can make very good power. It's an amazing octane booster. However, once you get to the point to use methanol as fuel, you need a lot like a lot. Once you get to use it, you start to understand that, oh man, I, I'm burning like a gallon or two or three gallons of uh, that methanol through the day. And you're like carrying jags in the car, smell summertime in the trunk, you have that, that thing is all breathing, it like bleeds your eye. It's just like something that it, it's not for me. I prefer to use this just for, just for cooling. I'm not a big fan to run those systems with methanol. So instead of that, what I have here is uh, something that was made before we did the billet intake manifold to experience how I'm gonna be able to utilize the port fueling, what ECU to run with it, how complex to have the ECU system to be able to, to make it like a, an OEM integration where it hooks up to the fuel lines, what size fuel pump to run in tank and, and, and all that stuff. Honestly, this is probably the most efficient way that will, will work very good to 400 wheel. So the first thing that happens with direct injection, how do you know from driving experience if you maxed out? Let's say you don't know how to log and wh where to look. The first experience will be on a colder day or on an evening, your car will basically start to misfire. Factory intake manifold uh, performs very good. When we designed the uh, uh, billet intake manifold, we actually had a hard time to, to improve uh, goals that we were after to have them better than factory intake manifold. So if, you, if you're choosing to buy an intake manifold that doesn't really validate you where it shines over stock or where it performs better than stock, I would suggest to, to re rethink your choice. Might as well stick with the, with the factory intake manifold. The benefits from adding port injection in this kind of fashion over methanol, I would say, it just makes it no, no maintenance required. It's like installed once, 
it's plumbed in like just the same as the factory fuel system is being plumbed and if you're really running just about 350 wheel horsepower you can leave the in-tank fuel pump alone as long as it's in good shape and it's not contaminated on the pickup to provide enough flow it will be fine up to 350 wheel horsepower what we're trying to do right now is we we're trying to make a package with a new turbo system to basically utilize 80 percent of the oem stuff to bring down the cost for average guy where you don't need to buy a intake billet intake manifold to do this for fuel or for more air for stuff like that because it's so much that goes along with it water methanol it's still very needed feature to have uh, i fit them in most of the cars that go into the 400 horsepower range. The way I do it is like I add a nozzle that goes into the charge pipe in this area and it's truly set up for 50-50%. So this nozzle, it injects into the charge pipe after the intercooler, it's still the factory plastic charge pipe. And we made a mounting system that allows me to mount the injection pump on the subframe and it's just spaced enough to clear the gearbox, clear the charge pipe and utilizes the factory washer fluid tank. And with the electronics that we put together uh, for supporting port injection system and uh, boost by gear, I have the ability to trigger the water methanol pump as well. When to bring it in, to keep the intake temperatures where I want them to keep. Uh, direct injection system. Uh, uh, there are people that seem to think that by changing the direct injector, they will gain, I don't know how much power they expecting, but they'll gain enough to, to get the car there. I wish it worked like that, but it's, it's not quite like that. So the problem is not in the injector sizing it's in the pump um, the way direct injector work is it has a very limited interval of opening so how do you get more fuel is by adding more more pressure but what it is it's like uh, regardless how far you upgrade the pressure out of this unit you still limit it to uh, to an interval of how much fuel in that small window you have to to inject port injection again is where if you need a bigger injector, you fit it a bigger injector because it works when you need it. And if you look at the cars that truly run really high horsepower, they all have stage injection. This unit to perform on 30% efficiency more or like to pump another 30% volume from, from what it's doing. And this, this is healthy to operate at 150 bar. It would have to go in size where you physically can't fit it in there mm -hmm. and don't forget it's driven by the cam so all this adds load rotational load to the motor stress to the chain to to whatever goes in there so it has to be within a balance where you can justify to to have it so upgrading this is what was not an option at all port injection seems to be the most beneficial uh, in terms of reliability I've never had injectors issues or pump issues running E85 running running whatever it seems like once you add port injection to support it help you can see that the operation of the high pressure fuel pump becomes so consistent and so smooth and you you don't even need to run it on the edge of its threshold you can drop uh, drop pressure like 20-30% uh, that you would normally uh, run it at peak to deliver what you're trying to deliver so you're not even stressing the unit as hard because now you have all the demand from the from, from the port injection side. Mm -hmm. When you want to run full E85 paired to factory fueling system it's a lot more complex than the system that is designed to support up to E30 to E40 question is, is it really necessary to run E85 to justify the, the complexity? From tuning, from blending on the tables, it's insane amount of work to do it right and to do it in a way where you drive the car on the street and you, you have a good joy, like you're not swearing driving this or bucking or stalling or whatever, because it's so much going on with it. 
E85 shine, shines when you go with a bigger turbo because it helps it spool so much better. So to get it there, you need to run it at, 30, at 32 PSI, 34 PSI. And of course, you can't do that with regular pump gas. You have to have a suitable fuel to support it. So that's when E85 becomes really nice and really useful. Colder air intakes. Uh, factory intake, uh, everything that factory provides had some <laughs> major engineering behind it. So uh, we have our velocity stack uh, intake with an open filter. If you keep your engine with the stock head that revs to seven grand stock intake manifold, you trying to make 350 wheel horsepower, you don't need any of the intake. A factory intake with a drop-in panel filter will do just as good as any other intake. It was nice to find out that uh, this engine in stock shape, like this cylinder head in stock shape, it's a way better design, flows a lot better on the intake, on the exhaust. The bad part is in it is the combustion chamber. So I'm not sure why the factory left all these sharp edges here, but they basically work like a glow plug out of control. Same thing with this. Mm -hmm has to be handled by professional people that uh, I even don't do this uh, stuff myself. I tried multiple companies until I found companies that do the work to, how to say, standards that I'm after. But basically, if you have an N18 engine, regardless of what compression ratio you're trying to put into them, if you don't address the combustion chamber shape and volume, you will never be able to extract good timing response from tuning with, with these engines. There is so much imperfection in the, in the casting as well. Those imperfections cause the combustion chambers to have different volume, uh, which is not critical if you build a nine and a half to one compression ratio engine, but if you try to build a 10 to one or 10 and a half to one, this is where all these things become extremely important. If you try to correct combustion chamber volume by hand tools, you will be there for a long, long time. Efficiency of a power band comes from what's done into the, into the cylinder head. So it goes uh, very deep. The more you know, the worse it gets and the more expensive it gets. Uh, I prefer to stick with working with people that I've gained trust and we already have a mutual relationship, meaning they know what I expect to, to, to receive after all that work. Uh, porting job, it's like an art. Uh, like I said earlier, I truly insist you, if you want to do something like this, don't try to DIY it. On top of that, uh, I want to highlight and uh, point reliability concerns on top of the performance yes you put different size valves and this and that makes more power but you also have to keep in mind you're utilizing a core that it's already 10 years old or more n18 has got a freeze plug located here that it will pop out of the control and dump all the coolant into your crankcase and make a messy milkshake that it's so hard to clean this one is very ugly and very expensive. But if you're spending the money to rebuild an ICE engine, do yourself a favor. There is these freeze plugs that they will ruin all the show. So N18 has one in the middle. This guy has two on the top and one on the side. Because what happens is if you lose one of these guys, in an event where you're on the track or even if you went for a drive somewhere, there's so much harmonics vibrations going through these engines, especially when you make like really high, th this happened on a high, high horsepower car, uh, on my, actually my, my own car. And this is what it can turn into by, uh, by not doing what you should be doing. So oh my God. this cylinder had uh, dropped a coolant plug uh, in an event where it was caught, I thought it kind of early, considering having all the warning lights and stuff. What, what that did, it made the heat go past the threshold on the 
gauge it never went more than 110 and considering these cars run in stock at 100 degree celsius you would not think it could potentially harm it so much but that heat spike on an application that used to perform at this power level it caused to disrupt the valve seats so it's like a thermal thermal expan expansion so this is a factory size valve seat and this head was very low mileage and like you see it destroyed the entire engine pretty much uh, test that we've done we discovered that the factory interference for the clearance in between uh, the valve seat and the, the casting is really 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 loose so it made sense why such a small heat spike caused these guys to to move and uh, turn into a full full mess you have to take care like put fresh valve seats in the cylinder head and address the all the freeze plugs before you do any other work to porting or, or however this is just a peace of mind that your ten thousand or fifteen thousand dollar build one grenade down the road because you skipped some uh, some some basics when do you know if you need to port your cylinder head or you don't need to port your cylinder head if you just plan to have a mini at 300 wheel horsepower reliably you might as well leave those uh, ports stock and just get a set of camshafts it will be just as good there, i have enough customers that running 400 wheel horsepower with cams on a stock ports I uh, cannot justify to do the porting on the cylinder heads unless you're not going big turbo, unless you're not doing fuel system upgrade, because really the work for that cylinder head flow is when you go with a bigger turbo, you need more air flow to, to spool that turbo. And it's like a mutual cycle where you want to have a good flowing air into the motor and a good volume of flowing air out of the motor so it keeps in a nice balance to work efficiently where you're running a bigger turbo but your car doesn't have lag till like 45 5000 rpm mm -hmm. going back in the days when i uh, put together the first r400 kit i went for the first road test and i was so disappointed and so mentally broken because i was like man this thing is garbage <laughs> like my car was a lot more fun to drive it with the hybrid turbo than what I did with spending this much money and figuring out this turbo kit. And when you go for a first drive, you realize like, man, this doesn't work like that. Uh, the bigger size turbo you go, you need to spin it at a different shaft speed. To go there, you need fuel. I, I couldn't justify to put a 500 horsepower capable turbo on a stock motor and just try to run it somewhere. It, 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 it's just a waste and the power band, it will be not something to enjoy driving around town. Mm -hmm. The whole package has to be blent together on your power goals. I, and I've managed it successfully to 500 plus wheel horsepower where the characteristic of that car did not lose its drivability compared to even a factory car. Like the 520 wheel horsepower set up in my green car, it's more snappy and more responsive than a factory car is. And Marcus drove it and knows exactly what I'm talking about. We will try to share with you as much as I can. I appreciate Marcus uh, participating in this because I don't have time in my day to, to vlog, to do this kind of stuff, to do that kind of stuff. But I think Mini is a, is a great uh, community. Uh, it's a really cool car. It's very hard to translate it to people that have not experienced to drive a Mini that performs of this kind. Um, and I've uh, had friends uh, from other car scene driving it and they like looked confused, happy, weird, like they were trying to figure out what the hell is this and how it doesn't make any sense. So it's a very fun platform and I'm trying to do my best to to support the community that I have behind me.